the fundamental like cornerstone lesson of like Fred Rogers, and he often said this was be deep and simple. And I bring this up like both because it was important to him and because I find that it's in many ways the hardest precept of Fred for me to follow. And I think it is for other people as well. Like we live in a very distracted age. We all have, you know, sort of like five inch distraction machines, like in our pockets. At any point in the day, you can get in touch with anyone in the world or look up anything or watch any video. And it takes a lot of effort to say, I'm just going to concentrate on the thing that's in front of me. A question asked courageously, answered honestly, and lived authentically can change your whole life. For me, that question was, how can I use what I have, what I love, and what I know to bless the lives of others? The School for Good Living and this podcast are one answer to that question. Hi, I'm Brian Miller. I know that the world can work for everyone, but that it won't until it works for you. I've created this to help you make the difference you were born to make. It's a series of conversations with thought leaders who are moving humanity forward. And in each episode, I explore their lives and the work they do. I also ask them to break down how they've gotten their books written, published, and read. This podcast is all about exploring the magic and mystery, and sometimes the misery, of the creative process. So if you have a mission, a message, and the motivation to share it, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the School for Good Living. My guest today is Gavin Edwards. He's an American journalist and a nonfiction writer. He has written 12 books. His most recent book, and the one that we talk about in this interview, is a book called Kindness and Wonder, Why Mr. Rogers Matters Now More Than Ever. This book, I learned so many things that I didn't know about Mr. Rogers. I just found this book so inspiring. It really caused me to think about the kind of person I wanna be, the way I'm living my life, the kind of contribution that I might make in the world. And I loved talking with Gavin. I hope you enjoy this conversation. In 1999, Gavin started writing for Rolling Stone magazine, where he wrote 12 cover stories. He's also written books about some other big personalities lately. Just a few years ago, he published a book called The Tao of Bill Murray, which is, as you might expect, a brief biography of Bill Murray. And he also has written a book about Tom Hanks, The World According to Tom Hanks. Gavin has written for Rolling Stone, The New York Times, and Wired. He graduated from Yale with a degree in English. In this interview, we really talk a lot about two things. One is we talk about the life and philosophy, the lived philosophy of Mr. Fred McFeely Rogers. That was his real middle name. And the inspiration that we can take from that. Gavin is an incredible storyteller. He shares a few of the stories that he learned and how his life was changed from diving so deeply into the life of Mr. Rogers. And the other thing we talk quite a bit about is about writing. And part of what I love about talking with Gavin is that it's it's evident to me that writing is who he is and it's something that he's very good at. We talk about things like how he chooses a book, knowing that it's a, it's a big commitment, big investment of time and Everything he says yes to, of course, is saying no to other things. So we talk about, I don't know that I want to go too deep into all the different book-related things we talk about, but if you have any interest whatsoever in not just creativity and the writing process, but listening to how someone thinks about his craft, how he approaches it, and the kind of advice or experience that you can only get from somebody who really is living and working in his zone of genius I think you'll find this interview to be useful and very inspirational. One of the things I said to to Dallin, my producer, after we wrapped this interview was, I just love the way I feel <laughs> after having talked to Gavin. I just want to carry that feeling around with me for the rest of the day and the rest of my life. It's pretty fantastic. So I, I believe that you will enjoy this interview. I hope you do. Thanks for listening. Please enjoy this interview with my new friend, Gavin Edwards. Gavin, welcome to the School for Good Living. Thank you, Brian. I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm glad you're here. Gavin, will you tell me, please, what's life about? <laughs> <laughs> We've known each other four minutes. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, sort of, and why warm up? You know, like, uh, let's start with the small stuff and we'll go on from there. I mean, wow, that's a great question. I have never been asked that, and I don't think in my hundreds of interviews of other people I've ever asked anyone that. 
But I guess it's something that I do think about sometimes. And if I have to boil this down into one sentence, it's uh, life is about leaving the world in a better place than it was when you came in. And that's sort of not the only thing that like one does in life or the only priority one has, but if, if it's just sort of like a bottom line endeavor that, you know, sort of, I think you need to feel like that hopefully you live a long and happy life, but at the end of it, the world is a better place because you were in it. Yeah. I love that perspective. Tell me, given that that's your, your view of what life's about, how do you go about that? So I, I mean, some of this is filling it in backwards that, you know, sort of if I think if I had like age 17, I had said that to myself, maybe I would have like embarked on a different path that, you know, sort of like, you know, there's a version where, you know, sort of like, maybe I say I should like be a doctor or an emergency worker. But what I actually think had happened was, as with many people, you sort of like follow the gifts that you're given. And in my case, it was always very nimble as a writer. And I uh, sort of knew that, you know, sort of like I could happily spend my days, you know, sort of putting together sentences and paragraphs. And it's like always been just sort of like this like level of excitement for me when I'm crafting something that works. It's sort of like, it's almost like good carpentry where just like everything is honorable and, you know, sort of like the joint fits and you know that it's right and that you've found like the perfect word or the perfect transition. But then as uh, time goes on, it's thinking about more than just sort of like, hey, that was fun. And I got to, you know, sort of like go travel to some cool places. And I had a good time writing this. It's making sure that like the things you do, you know, sort of like have a positive impact on the world. And some of that is, you know, I've got a fairly broad definition of that, that it can be, you know, sort of, you can provide entertainment and distraction. And like, that's, that's a healthy thing in society. But, you know, sort of if somebody, you know, sort of says, hey, I learned more, you know, I read this interview with like Johnny Depp and, you know, sort of like I think about him a lot and I feel like my life is richer because I know where he's coming from, what he's doing. Great. You know, sort of like I would do a Rolling Stone cover and that would be a thing. But then I think I'm also, because I've been thinking more lately in the books I've been writing about people having like a philosophy and how they implement that philosophy. And I know we're going to talk about Fred Rogers, but also I've uh, done books recently on Bill Murray and Tom Hanks called The Tao of Bill Murray and the, the world according to Tom Hanks, respectively. And thinking so much about where somebody is coming from and why they're doing what they're doing and what impact they want to have on the world, that you can't help but think about that yourself. Like, you know, sort of in your, both because you're carrying, like, uh, I'm helping explain their message and their philosophy to the rest of the world. And because, you know, sort of like, well, what am I doing? How am I spending my days? Yeah. No, I, I had a bit of a similar experience, I think, when I, I wrote a book about my dad after five years after he passed, and I spent two years collecting stories from people who knew him about the difference he'd made in their lives. And it certainly caused me to think about how do I want to be remembered? You know, how do I right. want to live? So let me ask a question that my six-year-old really wants to know the answer to, which is, does Taylor Swift's private plane smell like bubblegum? <laughs> It might now, but at the time it was just, it was one of her first, I think it was her first private plane ride. It was going from, I was following her around when her first album had come out and she was like on MTV for the first time. And she was saying that she was kind of like, you know, sort of like taking like these little pictures in her head. Like I, I want to like not forget this moment. And it turned out to be the beginning of her career rather than like the highlight of that career. And so I don't know that like how vividly she still remembers it, but there was about <laughs> eight of us crammed into this small private plane. I remember a plane that small, there is a toilet, but it serves as an extra seat. They put something on top of it. So like it actually, and so like, I think the drummer like had to like get, you know, sort of like the throw <laughs> appropriately enough. Why is it always the drummer? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Have you spent a lot of time with drummers, Brian? <laughs> Well, I, I have a good friend. I actually have a writing partner who is a who is a drummer. And, uh -huh. you know, sometimes they're out front or very well recognized, like the Neil Peart's or Phil Collins of the world. But as often as not, I think they're kind of relegated to the toilet seat. <laughs> <laughs> they're a different breed. And God bless them. <laughs> yeah. And one thing you mentioned. So you've written this book about Bill Murray. You've written this yes. book about Tom Hanks. The most recent book about Fred Rogers, who, of course, passed already. But one thing I'll just ask here, I won't wait till the writing part, is when you when you write a book about a recognizable figure like this, yes. do you approach them at the at the outset? Are they participating in this? Do you go ahead even if they're not? How do you how do you approach that? 
obviously Mr. Rogers was dead, but I did write a letter like sort of to the estate because I went up and I did research at, you know, sort of like the Fred Rogers, like a center where they've got like a lot of his archives and so on. I mean, I always get in touch with people at the beginning and how it goes depends on what they want. So, you know, they're, they're public figures. And so there's a lot to write about, even if they don't want to sit down and like give me sort of like a 17 hour interview of here's everybody, uh, everything I was thinking about. In the case of Bill Murray, I actually started out as a magazine article for Rolling Stone. And it was the original conception was it was going to be an oral history of Bill Murray, where I spoke with everybody except Bill Murray. And that's very Bill Murray ish. Yeah, right. And because like I knew I'd heard he had no agent, no manager, no publicist. He didn't love doing interviews. I'm like, well, here's a way of writing about him. And I, in that case, I was fascinated by you may have heard these stories of. You know, he crashes your party, he washes the dishes and leaves. Or like all this, you're playing kickball and all of a sudden like Bill Murray like runs up and joins the game for like 10 minutes and then like off he goes. And so I wanted to know, why does he do this? Like, where does that come from? What's that about? So I interviewed him and we had like sort of like, I got to ask him like the really important questions that I wanted to ask him. And I said, hey, I want to do this oral history thing. You know, like, would that be okay? And then he's like, eh. I don't want you bothering my family and my friends. I'm like, well, okay, I respect that. But I realized that what I still could do in that case was that it, there were so many people whose lives he had touched and had an impact on. So that like, I wanted to talk to them, you know, like, hey, the people who've been like dining out on this like story from the time they were playing like piano in a hotel bar and like Bill Murray like sang with them until 4 a.m. Great, you know, like, and so it became about you know, sort of figuring out his philosophy, not just from like sort of his explanation of it, because he, a lot of it was very like intense and personal. He didn't want to just lay it out on the table, but by what we can observe, like, okay, how does he live his life? You know, sort of like, what are we getting out of this? So in that case, that was how I approached that. Tom Hanks, you may have heard, is crazy into typewriters. And so I started off by, I found, you know, I don't own a typewriter anymore, but I typed up a letter and sent it to him. And I got back this very charming letter in which he said, ah, I'm kind of busy for the next two years. So it wasn't a very helpful letter, <laughs> but- But he responded. He responded and he responded in like a really kind of delightful way. And so A, I felt good that I, I wasn't blindsiding him. And B, whenever I got in touch with anybody else who was actually friends with him, sort of people like- Peter Scolari, who co-starred on the Bosom Buddies with, if they got in touch with Tom to say, hey, this guy got in touch with me, he always said, yeah, the guy's fine. Go ahead and talk to him. So I sort of like had his blessing to like speak with other people. He just sort of wasn't interested in laying it all out for me. Wow. How do you choose your subjects? I mean, I know writing a book is, you know, like a year is not unusual to spend on researching yeah. and drafting and, and this. So this is a big commitment. How do you settle on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write about this person or I'm going to choose this topic? How do you make those decisions? I think of this in a Venn diagram way that like the thing that makes it possible for me to do a book is that it's got to be in this overlapping center of things I care about and things other people care about as well. That, you know, sort of like I could be, there's things that like I'm devoted to, like in kind of a cultish way, but it's not good to spend a year of my life if ultimately I'm like writing for sort of like, you know, sort of 2000 other people uh, nationwide. It's not, you know, publishers aren't going to like that. It means I don't get to keep on uh, like having a career and doing this. And often I try to write about things that I do care about in a fringy, passionate way, but the appropriate venue is not a book. Maybe that's a magazine article. Maybe that's, you know, sort of me just sort of like posting things on my personal website. So for things that are like sort of, you know, Random House or The Shed or Macmillan, like wants to be in business with me, they want something that there's presumably going to be an actual audience for. But the third overlapping thing with these books I've been doing lately is I've been thinking about people, it's not just enough that somebody is somebody who I'm interested in, other people are interested in. I'm trying to write about sort of like what they care about in the world and how that manifests itself. So it has to be somebody who has like a philosophy. Like I often think of just as a counterexample, Kevin Bacon seems like a perfectly decent guy. He's been in lots of movies that you've enjoyed over the years, but fundamentally he's just like a working actor. Like, I don't think there's anything like, oh, this is what like animates him to do this where I can say, you know, sort of like, this is like the Kevin Bacon philosophy of life. I'm sure he has one for himself that gets him through the day, but the people who really work for this are the people who sort of seem to have something going on beyond the work that they do and how they approach the world. How do you recognize someone that has that? Well, I mean, I think you see it, you know it. That, I mean, 
even not thinking of celebrities, like you recognize this like in your own life, like, you know, sort of like if you're talking with like other people at like the coffee shop or the playground or the parent teacher night, you know, sort of there's some people who are just kind of like floating through the world. And there are other people who like very quickly pick up like they've got like a point of view that like animates them. And sometimes it's something that you say, yes, I'm like, oh, my, we're, we're fellow travelers. Let's uh, like, let's become friends. The other times like, oh. I'm glad that works for you. But I think it's actually relatively rare, though, that most people, I think, tend to drift down the river of life, which is understandable. Like, life is a really powerful current, <laughs> you know, sort of like, you know, sort of like exerting any agency over it all, let alone trying to you know, sort of like you know, swim up in the other direction. Like, it's a lot of work. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's talk for a few moments about your latest book about kindness and wonder, why Mr. Rogers matters more than ever. First of all, I love this book. So thank you for writing this book. Thank you, Brian. I really appreciate that. No, it was, it was really a joy to do. I can imagine. I was of the era where Mr. Rogers was on television and I remember watching. I don't think I was maybe what would be considered a devoted fan, but I remember enjoying the episodes I watched, but I certainly had no idea about what was informing his work. You know, I didn't know he was an ordained minister. I didn't know about his worldview. I didn't know, you know, he weighed 143 pounds and that <laughs> meant something to him, you know, and all this. But let me let me start by asking you this. Why did you, so we talked a little bit about your come from and why you choose the projects you do and things like that. But why specifically this book? Who did you write it for? What did you hope it would do for them? How did you hope the world would be different? Or anything, anything like that. Tell us about why you settled on this one and what your what your hopes were for it. Sure. I mean, I came to it via Tom Hanks. So, like, given like all the Venn diagram stuff that we've just been speaking about, there aren't as many people who fit where I want that as I would like. That you know, I sort of like I know what I'm looking for, but a lot of people I say, ah, oh, that's not quite it. And then actually, someone suggested like, hey, have you thought about Mr. Rogers? And you know, sort of. I hadn't, like, just because, you know, like, well, for a few reasons. One is that, like, you know, he's been dead for close to 20 years. And I sort of knew there was more to him than I had experienced when I was a child. But I think that, you know, sort of the childhood impression of him is so powerful, it can be hard to overcome that. But once I started thinking, oh, like, uh, maybe Fred Rogers, I realized he would be perfect. That he is, you know, sort of exactly the kind of guy, in his case, it's this core, you know, he was a very deep, thoughtful guy. But like the bedrock is just everything was about the welfare of children that, you know, sort of you ask him about like sort of any bit of public policy or, you know, sort of like anything of like, how do we approach this? And, you know, like he would always quickly turn into how is this going to affect the children in the room? And so I think I was less, you know, obviously if people read the book and they started using that prism, like I would be all for that. But I think my goals were more specifically, uh, like, I feel like if people sort of like went for like spent their days being about like three percent more like fred rogers like <laughs> we would all be in a much better place right now it feels like the world right now is uh, and even like before you know sort of like the scary stuff of like the pandemic and people being isolated and disconnected in different ways the world is like it's louder it's cruder you know sort of like things just feel like every year of my life everything just gets a little meaner and I can't single-handedly, you know, sort of like sweep back the ocean, but what I can't, and I don't think any one person can reset the tone of like modern society, but if uh, what can happen is if lots of people push it like a little bit in the right direction, then I think we're all going to be in a better place. And so that's what I'm hoping for with the book. And you can't quantify it, but I do know that enough people have responded to it and reached out to me that it's having some impact. So I feel good about it and that, you know, sort of like, and maybe it's in ways that I'm never going to directly see because, you know, sort of like somebody reads it in Philadelphia and then it's just like a little more like a little kinder to their coworkers and like, and that ripples out in ways that you don't know. But like, that is uh, my hope that, you know, just sort of like whoever reads the book takes as an opportunity to you know, sort of like say, Hey, I can't live every minute of my life this way, but when can I do it? And how can I make it like the world a better place? 
Yeah, I, I hope that happens as well. And I'd like to think that's happened for me, <laughs> having <laughs> read it, you know, I've even in the in the weeks, you know, since I picked it up, it's it's caused me to, to think a little differently about even something like how early I go to bed, you know, knowing that he went to bed at 930 at night. Yeah, you know. It, it's pretty Has remarkable. It really, like, have you uh, have you adjusted? You think? Yeah, I in the last this week at least, I have committed to going to bed by eleven. And I'm normally, you know, easily you know, a midnight, even one a.m. type person. But that's something it really has caused me to, to think about. And I would imagine, you know, where you were spending so much time and going deep into his life, that you've got favorite stories, whether they made it in the book or not. And I'm wondering <laughs> if you'd share what are what are some of your favorite stories about Fred about Mr. Rogers that you you came across in the creation of this book? One of my favorites is Fred Rogers is on an airplane. I believe he was actually heading out to California to interview Bill Bixby and Lou Ferrigno from The the Incredible Hulk for like a a week of shows about the superheroes that he did, trying to help children distinguish between sort of the fantasy and the reality of it and like, why is it there? He is seated behind a little girl who is flying alone for the first time and is terrified. The flight attendants, you know, come by and like they are saying versions of like, you've got nothing to worry about, you know, sort of like, you know, don't cry, everything's going to be fine. And he is, sees this and like, she's not calming down because it's actually not helpful to tell people you need to calm down, you know, you have nothing to worry about. And he uh, writes her a little note thinking that maybe she'll know who he is. And it says, there are many reasons to cry and they're all fine. If you'd like to talk with me about it, you know, sort of like uh, I'm Mr. Rogers and I'm sitting right behind you and uh, passes to her. And that's what she needs that, you know, she needed some, uh, you know, and they have a conversation and it turns out that like her father was in fact also incredibly afraid of flying. And so that rubbed off on her. And uh, so like, and she was worried about that because now she's like flying alone and he's not even there. And, uh, you know, just like being able to like communicate and like express her fears meant that you know sort of like she was fine with it then and you know like and so he sits next to her for the entire flight and they have like a long conversation about superheroes Uh, and so you know she was happy that she got to sit next to mr rogers and he was happy that he got to like talk with a kid but like the real point is that you know sort of if you can like anything that you can discuss a name is not going to be as terrifying once you do it and he knew that in his bones yeah that's really beautiful and that's one of the things that I really appreciated in reading about his life was to see how how congruent he was, you know, that he really, I think, was on a mission. And it was true, truly in service to children. And, you know, why people choose the work they do or they are the way they are, you know, maybe we'll never know. But I really, I really appreciated seeing that, how it would manifest, you know, in many different ways throughout his life and, and how he seemed to be very grounded person. And even something like, I love the story that's in the beginning about his grandmother that buys the piano. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, that buys this Steinway that today in today's dollars would have been like a $70,000 instrument. Right. And so for your listeners, he was getting serious about playing piano and he came from wealth, I should say, but like, uh, you know, sort of like his family, like owned a couple of factories in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, which is a little bit outside of Pittsburgh. And he went to visit his grandmother who said, well, like, all right, you know, sort of, you know, he said, I really like to like progress as a pianist. Like I need like a real piano in the house. And she said, okay, so like go pick one out and I'll pay for it. And he went to like the Steinway showroom and spent like an afternoon, you know, sort of like trying out every piano. And he picked the one that sounded best, which was like a Steinway concert grand. And to his grandmother's credit, you know, like she had the money and she could tell that like he was serious about it. And I think he had never asked for anything like material before. He was not like a wheedling child. who was always like, buy me a new whatever. And she's like, wrote him a check and he came back with the, uh, to the showroom with the check, much to the amazement of the salesman. And then he kept that piano for the rest of his life. So every, you know, sort of like song that you think of by Fred Rogers from It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood to like, what do you do with the mad that you feel? He wrote it on that piano. Yeah. See, that's so awesome to me that in some ways I, I admire it. In other ways, I envy, you know, people who have that internal sense of congruence or that sense of direction from the time they're young and then it guides them or they stay on that path their whole life. And I love especially that he achieved at an extraordinary level because I think we all aspire to that, or at least, you know, I think it's a fundamental need for human beings to be recognized, to be respected, to be loved. And 
to see that he was able to do that without compromising himself, but instead by being himself, you know, to me was really cool. And, and it made me think a little bit, you know, like when he left the job at NBC in New York city, which in the, in the early days of television where he could have stayed and tried to climb a ladder or be something he wasn't. And he just knew he's like, Nope, I want to go back to where I was raised in Pennsylvania. Yes. You know, and do this relatively small time television if he was listening to what others might have thought. Right. I mean, it seemed like a crazy career move to everyone around him. And I think it wasn't even so much they wanted to be back home, but it was more that he wanted to do the type of shows that he wanted to do. And he knew that at a public television station that was like understaffed and had like hours of airtime to fill, that he would actually like be able to like get a show on the air. And so, you know, he hadn't formed the idea of, I mean, so much of this was just sort of like excellent instincts. Like he went into television saying, I think I can do good work there, but you know, but without there being enough TV for him to sort of like have a sense of what it was going to be. And they went to public television, basically saying, I think I can do good work there, but without like a sense of like necessarily that it was going to be a children's show, let alone the specific shape of the neighborhood. But he just sort of knew himself well enough to like know where he could thrive. Yeah. I, I think that's really cool. And even things like when he, you know, got and kept the rights to the songs he'd written. Yes. You know, or when he something as simple as, you know, the way later in his career that he decorated his office, that there was no desk. Right. You know, because he didn't want to have this unequal interaction between human beings. Like I'm the authority and you're the supplicant or something. Right. People came to see him. Like, you know, there was uh, these old couches, actually couches that had belonged to his like beloved grandfather. And so they had a lot of personal meaning for him, but for it was clearly not like a fancy couch. They you know, sort of like people came in and like the office was like comfortable and homey. And, uh, you know, they immediately, as I spoke with someone who I think compared it to a, a teddy bear stand. <laughs> and the humility of not having his many awards and honors on the walls, which by then he'd earned many. Sure. Right? And he could have easily had, you know, a shrine to himself about all of my accomplishments and, you know, things like that. And instead, I think they were stacked in a hallway or something. Yeah, he just kind of stashed them like in a the corner of the hallway. I think eventually his staffer said, well, like we should actually put these away someplace. <laughs> uh, but I think uh, for several years, they just kind of piled up in a corner. Yeah. And, and there's something to me. I remember a few years ago when I read Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs and I, I read that, that story that stayed with me about, I think it was like his 30th or 35th birthday. It, I think they held it, you know, I don't know if it was the Fairmont or some nice hotel in San Francisco. And people brought all these gifts and he just left all the gifts. Right. It was like yeah. he wasn't concerned about the material aspect of life or at least those particular gifts. And and it's just, you know, people who are on who are on a mission, who clear who they are and where they're headed. It's to me, there's something really inspiring about that. And I love seeing that just in the many examples in this. But two very different people. I mean, you read that book and like, you know, sort of I'm I'm on an Apple computer right now. I admire what he accomplished. But, you know, it sounds like he was mostly not a pleasant person to be around. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. How do you think your life is different as a result of having dived so deeply into this, the life and work of Mr. Rogers? That's a really good question. So I think most people ask me more about, you know, sort of like, how he touched my life when I was a kid. And that's definitely like, that's foundational work that, you know, sort of like I put that away and I didn't even realize what he had done for me until decades later. Cause I used to watch the show every day, you know, sort of like, I loved it. It gave me this sense of, I, I was always kind of like awkward and high energy and not quite fitting in. And I felt like very, you know, sort of like accepted and like nurtured by him, but, but it's aimed at a specific age range, you know, sort of like basically, up through kindergarten, maybe. And then when you're done, you know, sort of it very quickly, like, seems childish to you. If you're, like, a fourth grader looking at it, you're like, it's why it's easy for, like, comedians to make fun of it. But then when I revisited it now, it's really more than I think anybody else I've ever written about. It's made me think, like, really carefully about how I want to present myself in the world. Like, I find a lot of where it's... It hasn't changed so much what I do, like, say, how I like, act with my family. Like, I think that there was always a sense of, you know, sort of like, I'm going to uh, take care of these people. And, you know, sort of like, and this is uh, the way I want to, like, engage meaningfully with, like, my children and my wife and, like, uh, and the world I want to build here. But I think about it a lot in terms of, you know, like, especially on social media, uh, where the default setting is, you know, sort of like snark and sarcasm. And, like, not even, like, vicious necessarily, but just sort of like, and I find myself often saying 
do I want to say this sort of funny but kind of mean-spirited thing? And often the answer is no. And then like the larger question of like, you know, sort of like, I do not present myself as being the, like that I am Fred Rogers or I like, I think, you know, sort of like, I mean, he was a human being too, but like, there's a reason people often refer to him like sort of in saintly terms that like he had sort of this infinite patience and this infinite like wellspring of like love for the world. I don't have that, <laughs> but I admire that. And I've been happier fostering those qualities in me. And one of the things that I've been, and I've wanted to be true to those qualities, especially in the wake of uh, this book. And I've been thinking a lot lately about how is that part of me as I go forward? Like, I'm not, you know, sort of spending the rest of my life, you know, sort of like as a Fred Rogers acolyte, but I'm also not discarding the lessons that I've learned and, you know, sort of like just trying to integrate it and uh, into like the other things that I do. And I think it's having more of a lingering effect than I necessarily even expected when I started writing the book. Wow. You know, one of the one of the things that when I talked about it has caused me to think about things differently. Two of them that come up for me right now and in, in hearing you share, you know, how it's made a difference for you too is one is really like being willing, trying or being willing to look at the world, you know, through another person's eyes. And and I think the specific thing that comes to mind for me right now is that song, You Can't Go Down the Drain. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That that adults would think that was silly that you're writing and performing a song to kids to reassure them that they can't go down the drain. But he was very well aware that's a real concern for young children. Absolutely. Right. And that was, that was so amazing to me. And and I see that in my own life. And I suspect some people listening will see that whether they're aware of it or not in the work they're doing when they market, when they're marketing anything or you're writing something, right? That's a little easier to see that, okay, someone else is gonna read this. Can I put myself in their shoes? Can I think about how this is gonna land with them? But just how Fred was a master at knowing who he was speaking to, what they needed to hear, how to say it, you know, that is just brilliant. And how much of that is innate and how much we can develop, you know, I guess we it remains to be seen in how hard we try, but I thought that was really inspiring. And, and maybe one of those ways that also touched me, and I shared this, on, in a phone call with my mom last night, as I was telling her about the book, about that story when he when he asked that that child with a disability that he visited if that child would pray for him, you know that was amazing. Would you would you be willing to relate that story and why he asked that child to pray for him? Sure. So uh, this was the story that I first learned through the writer uh, uh, Tom Junod, whose uh, much fictionalized version of his encounter with Fred Rogers was the basis of the Tom Hanks movie. Mr. Rogers, I'm just going to read from the book, took a trip out to California where he met a 14-year-old boy with cerebral palsy. Because of the boy's condition, he didn't have the motor control needed to speak. He communicated through a computer. And when he was younger, some of his caretakers had abused him. He grew up loathing himself, convinced that God must hate him to punish him so, and sometimes even bawling his hands into fists and punching himself as hard as he could. But he had loved Mr. Rogers' neighborhood his entire life. And so when he heard Mr. Rogers was going to visit him, a charity made the arrangements. He was thrilled and terrified. When Mr. Rogers arrived, the boy was so nervous he kept hitting himself, badly enough that his mother took him into another room to calm him down. When he returned, Mr. Rogers talked to him, quietly and patiently, and then he had a question for the boy. I would like you to do something for me. Would you do something for me? The answer was yes. Of course, he would do anything Mr. Rogers asked of him. Mr. Rogers said, I would like you to pray for me. Would you pray for me? The boy fell silent, which meant that his computer fell silent as well. He had no idea what to say. Nobody had ever asked him for anything like this. Juno wrote, The boy had always been the object of prayer, and now he was being asked to pray for Mr. Rogers, and although at first he didn't know if he could do it, he said he would. He said he'd try. And ever since then, he keeps Mr. Rogers in his prayers and doesn't talk about wanting to die anymore, because he figures Mr. Rogers is close to God, and if Mr. Rogers likes him, that must mean God likes him too. And then Juno praised Fred for being perceptive and clever and finding a way to reach the soul of the damaged boy. Fred was perplexed. He couldn't quite believe that he'd been so misunderstood. Oh, heavens no, Tommy, he said. I didn't ask for his prayers for him. I asked for me. I asked him because I think that anyone who has gone through challenges like that must be very close to God. I asked him because I wanted his intercession. When you walk a mile, Mr. Rogers' sneakers, the world looks like a different place. It is not so important who receives the gift and who gives it. That's amazing. Once you start even thinking about it that way, you know, sort of like 
it really puts you in touch with these moments of connection. I mean, he thought of this, you know, like he definitely had a religious metaphor for like his connections with people. He often would say that he thought of sort of like, is uh, like that was where the Holy Spirit manifested himself. Like if he's talking on TV and there's like a little girl in Nebraska out there on like a shag rug listening to him, then like sort of like the connection that they make, like that's where the Holy Spirit is. That sort of like ineffable like space in between. And I think, you know, like whether like that is uh, your metaphor or not, like recognizing that something like remarkable is happening like uh, between two people, like once you're attuned to that, you know, sort of like you notice it when it happens and you want to like awaken it in yourself. And uh, if you say, if you like read about this story and you're moved by it, then the next time it doesn't matter whether you do something generous for somebody else or they do it for you. Like there's a little extra spark to it. You realize, oh, I'm like, this moment is here. What can I do to foster that? And so like, I think that was part of, you know, sort of like his wisdom, you know, like in that he could call attention uh, to that in people. Yeah. No, I, I think so. And, and I've, I've endeavored to, to really identify and learn from next level thinkers. And I know that's kind of a vague term, but to me, one of the qualities of, the, of a next level thinker is somebody who sees the things that others don't. Yes. And, and, and it's kind of, they're seeing the negative space when everybody's looking at, you know, the object or the positive, whatever, whatever's filling the positive space. And for him to be able to see that boy as someone close to God, not someone who was the, in need himself, you know, that's yes. total, that reversal, I think is just, just beautiful. So, okay. What else, before we transition to the enlightening lightning round, what else, <laughs> if anything, feels important or useful to say about your work, about this book, about anything we have or haven't talked about to this point? I would say just like the other thing like about this book, I want to say is that the fundamental like cornerstone lesson of like Fred Rogers, and he often said this was be deep and simple. And I bring this up like both because it was important to him and because I find that it's in many ways the hardest precept of Fred for me to follow. And I think it is for other people as well. Like we live in a very distracted age. We all have, you know, sort of like five inch distraction machines, like in our pockets. At any point in the day, you can get in touch with anyone in the world or look up anything or watch any video. And it takes a lot of effort to say, I'm just going to concentrate on the thing that's in front of me. And I always had the sort of personality where I would you know, maybe be reading like five books at once instead of, you know, sort of like zeroing in on it. So it's not in, you know, some of the things that like Fred Rogers teaches, you know, sort of like see the best in other people, like, you know, sort of like, uh, let, like sort of make a joyful noise, let music be hard, like connect with other people. Like, oh, sure. Yes, I get that. I want to do it. You know, being deep and simple is hard, but it's also been like incredibly rewarding that like I can look and say the time I spent like working on one big project like really pays off for me. The time I spend living in one place and being with like my family and being in the neighborhood, that also pays off. And as with all things, it's not binary. You know, it's not like there's the good way and the bad way, but I, I think for many people making that effort, like they will find very quickly that like it pays dividends and that, you know, sort of like saying, if you're not deep and simple 100% of the time, just like, making the conscious choice to be deep and simple, at least some of the time will get you someplace that you haven't been before. No, that that's wonderful. And, and I'll just call this to the listener's attention as well. I, I thought this was really cool how, you know, this book would have been for me, enjoyable and meaningful if it had only been this biographical, you know, telling of Mr. Rogers life and work, but you go beyond that by having the second, basically the second half or the last third or whatever be 10 ways to live more like Mr. Rogers right now. Right. And I wanted to give you enough about his life that you knew who he was and where he was coming from and how he lived it. But then I felt like what I could add that hadn't been out there before was really trying to sort of like distill this and say like, okay, you know, like here's what he did. And then also here's like how you can learn from that, uh, you know, sort of like in some cases, just sort of like pulling together a lot of different things from like the course of his life, you know, like how did Fred Rogers think about death, you know, sort of like when that happened in his life, like how did he explain it to children? How did he experience it in his own life? They, I think... You know, he was a deep enough thinker that like that really zeroing in on him, like it pays rewards. Yeah. And and what did he say about death? He was very aware of it as just sort of like a natural part of life that, you know, there was a classic episode of the show where um, there's a dead fish in the fish tank. And, you know, sort of like very calmly, you know, he sort of like 
It explains to the children, like, you know, the fish is dead, and here's what that means. And they go out to the yard and they bury it. And he talks about, you know, sort of like that's natural to be sad at a time like this, and like talks about his, you know, sort of childhood, like pet dog dying. Then says that, you know, this is something that, you know, sort of like, you know, I remember seeing like my father cry when his father died, and then I uh, cried when he died. And that, you know, sort of knowing that, you know, sort of like it is a huge emotional thing at the same time, it is also a natural part of life and like being accepting of all of that, you know, sort of knowing what you can and can't fight against, I guess. And, you know, sort of like it's it's hard to remember at a time like that, but it's worth remembering. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. How you doing, by the way? I'm good. How about yourself? <laughs> I'm good. I'm doing good. Let's transition to the enlightening lightning round. So again, this is a series of about 10 questions that are relatively brief. For the most part, I will ask the question and step aside. I might tug on a thread here or there, but you're welcome to answer as long as you want, but that's the basic design. Okay. Okay. Question number one, please complete the following sentence with something other than, speaking of Tom Hanks, a box of chocolates. <laughs> Life is like a... Ah! <laughs> Life is like a life-size map. I mean, life is not just a metaphor. I mean, everything is a metaphor for life because life is everything. And so there is a Lewis Carroll who wrote Alice in Wonderland once wrote about how like the most possible, the best map of England would be one that was like the size of England that had everything <laughs> written on it that you could roll over uh, and like it would all align. And I think that, you know, like life is like life and, and it contains it all. And whatever part of it you choose to zero in on is going to reflect back on the larger thing. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Number two, here I'm borrowing Peter Thiel's famous question. What important truth do very few people agree with you on? Well, many people would agree with this in word, but not in action, which is it's thinking about just sort of like, and this is particularly like relevant right now, but just sort of like the notion of self-care and, you know, specifically like getting enough sleep, which we talk about, like the world doesn't get enough sleep. And I think everyone will pay lip service to that, but hardly anybody will actually say, I'm going to go to bed and get like, uh, it feels like the whole world is running on like adrenaline and caffeine and right now sort of like fear and nervous energy. And it's been really, I think I've been uh, trying to be really careful, like in the, the last, you know, sort of like weeks of like self-quarantining, making sure that like, I actually do get eight hours of sleep and listen to like what my body is telling me. And I think that's one of those things like everybody knows, but finds it like hard to do. It doesn't mean they're bad people, <laughs> but, but sometimes it's good to listen to like the larger wisdom. Question number three. If you were required every day for the rest of your life to wear a t-shirt with a slogan on it or a phrase or a saying or a quote or a quip, what would the shirt say? <laughs> you know, my brother-in-law, has. I once got him this t-shirt and he said it like materially like improved his life. And I think it's a comedic version of it, but it also it, like speaks to like sort of like a philosophy of the world. And the shirt said, I high five strangers. <laughs> That's so awesome. <laughs> and, you know, like, and it would, and people would go for it. And like, if you wore that shirt, he would walk around and, you know, like, and he would like high five with people through the day and like, and he would have a better day as a result and they would too. So wow. I think, I think that one's uh, road tested. I'm going to go with I high five strangers. I wonder how that would be received post COVID-19. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there will be some people still. And that I love that. That's another for me, like another take on the free hugs. <laughs> right. But a little yes. more in some ways, a little more jubilant, just like. <laughs> right. I will say, I mean, I don't know exactly how is go what's going to change post COVID-19. And I think there, uh, but what I have read about like sort of the Spanish flu is that everyone was very eager to get back to how things had been previously. So you're going to see at whatever point, like it is like safe and healthy to like go out to sort of like theaters and dances and restaurants again, people are going to want to do that. The big thing that apparently went away after Spanish flu and went away so much, you can't even believe it was ever a thing, is that apparently in the United States, uh, dinner tables used to have a communal drinking cup, 
really. That, you know, sort of like whether it was at like a restaurant or a home, there would be just sort of like a couple of like communal cups of water that everyone would drink from. And <laughs> haven't had that for the last hundred years or so. Uh, so. No, I, di- I, I didn't. I wasn't even, a, like you were saying, I wasn't even aware that was a thing. It used to be a thing. <laughs> That's pretty, ra- ra- pretty interesting. So, okay. Question number four. What book other than one of your own have you gifted or recommended most often? There's certain books that I find, I think they're most often novels where I just, you know, sort of, I was so impressed by uh, Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell, which coincidentally later was a Tom Hanks movie, but it was just sort of this dazzling, like, sort of force of like six interlocked stories and that sort of like cruelty and connection and uh, between them. And I said, it's just one of those things like, I want the, like, people to read this. I want to share the, the world. And then a book by Francis Spufford called Red Plenty, which was a collection of short stories. About, and it sounds so dry, but it isn't. But it's about the economic history of the Soviet Union. And <laughs> it's all, but in fact, like it's all of these sort of like characters caught up in that. And that's like kind of a larger backdrop and the theme. And it's about sort of like what they're doing in the context of that. Oh, in a family, uh, the jazz was an ABA team originally, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. I have given Terry Pluto's loose balls to many people over the years because I was, wow. so, and I don't know if your dad makes an appearance in it, but I would imagine he would have to. Yeah, I know he had that book on his shelf for a lot of years. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Why that? Why that book? I love that because it was a pocket of forgotten history that you know, sort of like, uh, I think it was amazing to me when I first read it that like, oh. Here's this whole other like alternate universe basketball where like I thought I knew everything about basketball. And then like here's like this crazy adventure that people went on, like sort of like outside of, you know, sort of like the the nice like mainstream, like this is like the the linear path that things go for. I would so like I like, you know, sort of like books that feel like they're opening up possibilities in different ways. I also um the Vladimir Nabokov's Pale Fire is another one that I've given a lot over the years. So which the first half of it is a poem and the second half is like commentary on a poem where it like the commentary goes off the rails and it becomes about, you know, sort of the uh, commentator is like telling the, the sort of the story of his exile from like royalty and like Zembla in Eastern Europe. And so, I mean, the common thread of all of these is just sort of like, they made me feel like things were possible, like with the form of a book that, that I didn't realize before. So it's not necessarily the underlying message of all of them, but just that all of them were sort of like ambitious and they opened up like the frontiers they didn't know were there before. Wow. Very cool. What What are you reading right now? I am reading right now. I just finished something called The Artificial Silk Girl, They're written by a young German writer. It was sort of the Bridget Jones diary of her day. She was living in Germany in the 1930s. And the backdrop is Hitler's rising to power, but it's also that sort of like the misadventures and sex life of like a young German woman kind of, and so it was a big hit in like a Bridget Jones diary kind of way. And it's sort of fascinating to see that it's this sort of comedy of manners, but like also set in the, you know, sort of, you know, that the stakes are so much higher than she even realized that she was reading the book. How about yourself? What are you reading? What am I reading? I'm reading, I just finished a couple of books by Stephen Cope, who is a spiritual teacher that teaches at Kripalu in Massachusetts. He wrote a book called The Great Work of Your Life. And then he wrote a book called Yoga and the Quest for the True Self. And his his most recent book is called Deep Human Connection. Okay. So uh, I'm really enjoying his work. I'm reading a book by an author named Jen Lauder, who wrote a book called Why Bother? That's all about, you know, it's, I like it because it's the personal growth, but from an honest perspective of like, look, life is hard and sometimes we get down and finding the reason why you would bother to do anything, you know, not just go find your purpose, rah, rah, rah. So, so I'm reading that. And then I was reading your, this book, Kindness and Wonder. And, oh, I'm reading a book every day. I actually don't like to share that, I, but I will. There's one book by this spiritual teacher that I had never heard of until a couple years ago. And this book sat on my shelf for a year probably before I picked it up, but it's, it's the only book I read from almost every single day. And it's called, I am that by Nisargadatta Maharaj. And it's, I find it really beautiful. I, re- I just read five minutes of it every single, almost every single day. That's lovely to have something that you can like dip into and just sort of like, it touches the right spot in you. And like, and sometimes five minutes is all you need. Yeah. It's, it's the first thing before my conscious mind starts chattering too loud. I just, <laughs> it's quiet. It's fun. Uh-huh. So I'm grateful for that. And given your 
what you just shared about what you've read, I can imagine that you, and I know you have been on Jeopardy. <laughs> I, I can see yes. why you'd be such a great <laughs> Jeopardy candidate. I came in second place and I went a uh, trip to France and a watch. And so, and it was, and I just, it was a delightful thing. I'd always watched game shows when I was a kid. And so it was just kind of like a childhood dream realized. That's awesome. Congrats on that. That's really neat. Okay, coming down the stretch, question number five. So you have traveled a ton all over the world. What is a travel hack, one or more, you could share more than one, Something meaning something you do or something you take with you when you travel to make your travel less painful or more enjoyable? Ah, I've got two travel hacks. One is if you are traveling east uh, multiple time zones, then, you know, sort of like, basically, when you get to wherever you are, Take a nap, but wake up before you actually feel like uh, that you need to just like sort of like the one hour nap. And then you can push through like the rest of the day and like sort of like get in like uh, the time zone of where you are. The other thing is that I, if I'm going to some place where I don't speak the language, I'm not very good with foreign languages. And sometimes, you know, ideally you really study up on where you're going and you can sort of like be fluent, but sometimes you don't have that opportunity. You can always, however, on the plane to like, if you're going to Portugal and you've got, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, like you've got at least an extra hour to learn 10 phrases, learn yes, learn no, learn excuse me, learn thank you, you know, just sort of like, because odds are where you're going, there'll be somebody who speaks English, but they're going to appreciate that you made the effort. It's a way of showing that like, I am a guest in your home, even though my Portuguese or whatever is not very good, I am trying and I'm not relying on you to do all the work for me. I have a friend who, when she was a young woman, made it through Italy just on the strength of me despachi, which uh, is basically, I'm, excuse me, but it literally means it's my fault. And uh, so when uh, she's in a restaurant, you know, she's like, I, gee, I don't understand the menu. She'd say, me despacho. Oh, no, 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 no. And like, then they want to help you because, you know, sort of yeah. clearly you're trying. So yeah. that goes a long ways. It goes sure. a very long way. And, you know, it's either that or just speaking louder, right? I mean, one of, <laughs> one of the two. <laughs> so, okay. Question number six. What's one thing you've started or stopped doing in order to live or age well? Ah, the biggest uh, change I made in uh, like my health in the last 10 years is that I finally recognized I did not have the metabolism I had when I was a young man, and I had to just like be much more mindful about what I ate. And in my case, that basically meant the way I made that work and made that not like my life is miserable is I don't snack between meals anymore. So I say I can pretty much eat what I want to, like, you know, sort of like three times a day, you know, sort of like the sensible portions of just about anything. But, you know, sort of like it's not such a bad thing to, like, be a little bit hungry at 4.30 p.m. and say I'm going to, like, push through dinner being a little bit hungry and then I'll get to eat what I want. And so I think that's probably the best move I made for, like, my long term ability to be in the planet long term. Yeah, no, good, good for you. And, and that, too, I know after dinner can be one that gets a lot of people Ah, no, I brush my teeth as soon as I can after dinner. Um, Smart. It, and that is like just sort of like a big psychological thing. I'm like, oh, I already brushed my teeth. You know, sort yeah. of like, uh, like, no thanks. I'll pass on ever. So there you go. That's just, you know, it's, it's not like I couldn't brush my teeth again, but it, sure. it, it's just, it's just enough of a psychological barrier. <laughs> Good for you. That's smart. Question number seven. What's one thing you wish every American knew? Oh, Wow going to answer this more metaphorically because I kind of answered it literally earlier, which is a foreign language. And so, uh, as I mentioned, I'm not actually very gifted with foreign languages myself, but I think of this in this context as more just like outside perspectives that, you know, sort of like, I think a lot of Americans, uh, you know, sort of like you have this instinctive feeling of USA number one. And I think it's very good to like learn about, uh, you know, sort of like not just the achievements of other countries, but, you know, sort of like some of the grievous things that the United States has inflicted on the other rest of the world. You can still be proud of the United States and not blinkered to how we have swaggered through the world at various points. And it, I think it's good to have an outside perspective on the country that we live in. And whether that means like reading an outside, just like sort of histories of, the, you know, how we've handled ourselves in other countries. I think we're all adults and we can say that United States have, has many things to be proud of and uh, many things to not be proud of. And our challenge as Americans is to foster the best qualities. Yeah. No, I, I wish that every American knew that too and did that. Number eight, 
What's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about making relationships work? I, th I think I was told this so many ways before it finally sank in, but just the value of listening. That means both being like engaged as a listener, like really, you know, sort of you know, paying attention to what someone is telling you, not just waiting for your turn to talk. It means, you know, sort of like many times what other people need is just to be heard. They don't need their problems solved. You know, sort of like they just sort of like knowing that you've sort of like spoken about it and somebody else understands, you know, sort of like that's the gift that you can give them. So I think that is the foundation for almost, you know, certainly, you know, sort of like romantic coupled relationships, but also sort of friendships and, you know, sort of business relationships, just like if, if you're listening to somebody, then it's going to go better. And I've learned this as, you know, sort of like an interviewer as well, that, you know, I would sort of show up to interview somebody and I have like my list of like 10 to 20 questions that I want to make sure that I got to. But the best stuff that always happened would be where I would like actually not be saying, okay, now I'm ready for uh, the next question, but like, oh my God, like, wait, they said something fascinating and I better, you know, sort of make sure like I understood what that was. And that's where like the magic happens. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And that, yeah, I, I'm with you on that. And, and, and to be honest, that's one of the things that I'm loving so much about, I hope developing myself as an interviewer is it's another way of cultivating presence. Yes. You know, yeah. and being in your head while also being very with, you know, the person that you're interviewing. I also found that like my professional interviewing skills made my personal life better, that I could be seated next to like almost anybody at say like a dinner party. And, you know, sort of like everyone's got something to talk about that, you know, if you're not like connecting with somebody, it just means you haven't asked the right question. Some people are better at, you know, bringing it out without like much of the prompting, but, you know, sort of being able to like ask people questions that like, get you to a conversation beyond. So what do you do for work? And what do you think of like the traffic today? You know, sort of like as a gift for both parties. No, ab absolutely. And, and, and I've had a kind of a similar thought where I think, you know, pe there's, there's something or, or usually more than just one thing, but if you get on that subject with someone, they just light up. It's like they yeah. turn on, you know, yes. <laughs> and if you haven't found it yet, if you haven't even looked for it, that's on you, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, not because they're, they're dull or uninteresting or whatever. But I think that's really fascinating. And I will tell um, your listeners a question that I sometimes go to is tell me about an adventure you had lately. Oh, what a great question. And it's sort of like everyone can define that differently for themselves. But whatever they consider an adventure is something that they're going to feel passionate about. So that often gets you to like a better place than you might have been. Yeah, that's great. I would imagine that you have a list of questions that you've cultivated over the years. Yes. Is that, mm -hmm. is that the case? Yeah, I mean, I try to, uh, if I'm going and speaking with somebody, you know, I part of uh, what I do, like professionally, is just sort of like making sure that I've done a lot of research. So I'm asking, you know, sort of like, I'm not just drawing from the master list. But I also know that like, some questions I've gone to over and over have paid dividends over and over. And so like, in a pinch, like, okay, I've, I can ask this and this and this. The interesting thing I find is, that there are certainly other writers that's true for and when I was younger, every now and then I would sort of try out a writer's like question, like the, this writer I admire a lot, Chris Heath, used to ask people, tell me uh, one kiss you will remember forever. I'm like, that's a beautiful question. And I asked a couple times, I never got anything. There was just something about, <laughs> you know, sort of like his, the way he connects with people as opposed to the way I connect with it. It just didn't work for me and it worked for him. And so it's interesting that and there's not one, you know, sort of secret master list of like 10 questions. If you have these, you're ready to go be an interviewer because it has to be in the way that you personally connect with somebody. Oh, yeah. No, for sure. that. And I don't know that we have a, a word for this in English and, and maybe we do and I'm not aware. Or I'm also not sure that I have the, the understanding of the word in, I don't know if it's Hindu or Sanskrit, correct, but that I've learned that the meaning of Tantra really is that energetic quality that accompanies any action or any communication. And so hearing you talk about where Chris would ask that, it might've been, you know, the energy with which it was accompanied, not just the content of the question that, right. you know, elicited yes, the exactly. response. It's kind of interesting. And we, and we all get to, we all get to find that, you know, for ourselves, but let me, while we're on the subject of interviewing, let me just ask you this here as well, because what you were saying about being present with someone and not just sticking to your, your list of questions, so to speak, 
And, that, and that's not, by the way, a slam on you having a list here, I realize. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I totally get it. Because I, I know I hear that, especially it seems with with newer interviewers, where the subject will say something. And I'm like, I'll go down that path. Like, ask more. And they're on to the next thing. I'm like, damn it, you know? But one thing that I see, and this is more prevalent when I find I'm interviewing people who are either further in their career or maybe more prolific or, or well-known where they get the same, basically probably the same 30 questions and their answers are more routinized, more rote. What have you found about break, not in, I, I hear how this might land. Anyway, what have you found about breaking somebody's pattern, about getting them out of this routine response to really get to a true, like a, something the listener experiences is true or the subject is boom, that opens up something. Absolutely. I thought about this a lot. So, and I used to, I think when I was younger, I would sort of like read or see somebody like giving essentially like the same, you've seen this, like maybe you see like sort of like the same like talk show guest on two different shows and they get asked the same five questions and they give like the little, the same five answers. I was like, well, that's phony. And then I got into the position where I started, you know, sort of like my first big book was about Mr. Lyrics. It was called Excuse Me While I Kiss This Guy. I, I remember that book, by the way. I was a bookseller at Barnes & Noble and I would shelve books. And I remember that. And it was a series, it's a series too, right? Yeah. Yeah. I did like three sequels and there was like page and a calendars and so on. It was, it was a lot of fun for a while, but I would go a lot of what I did for, to publicize that book is I would go on like morning radio shows, you know, like, Hey, you're on with like Cleveland for five minutes. And like, all right, now you're on with like Atlanta for five minutes. And they would ask almost always the same questions over and over. And you realize it's just like self-defense that, you know, you can't come up with like a new fabulous spin every time. And they don't even really need one. All of like the most people want when they're having this conversation is like a well-polished soundbite that's going to be entertaining for people. If it's informative, that's great. But they want you mostly to sort of like for it to be punchy and like have like a nice like the period at the end of it. But that's not usually what I'm looking for as an interviewer. Like, I don't want just like the little punchy soundbite. I really want someone to be like sort of engaging in a more thoughtful way and not sort of doing it by rote. So, you know, I think part of the overall thing we've been talking about, like about being present, being attentive, like that's all necessary. But I am insanely fixated on the first question uh, that I feel like I really do my research and I want to ask something that is both sort of like intelligent and gets to like sort of the themes of what we're going to be talking about and is not something that the person gets asked over and over. And I feel like that's sort of like, it's, you know, sort of like the bell that goes off at the beginning of the interview is saying, Hey, you're going to have to pay attention to this one. And then once people are sort of like engaged and they've woken up, you could then later ask something that maybe they've been asked eight times before, but they're not necessarily going to snap back into you know, like, here's my little like polished soundbite because it's in a different context. You're having that conversation. Interesting. I've heard that some interviewers will give their subject the first question, partly so they're not caught off guard. And I realize there's something about, you know, surprise and spontaneity and stuff like that. But I've heard, and the person I'm thinking of specifically is Tim Ferriss. I've heard that he will give his guest the first question he will ask so that they get off to a good start. Oh, that's interesting. And I've thought, I don't, I actually, I know people can obviously listen and that is, you know, what's life about is my first question for everybody. But I, in some guests, you know, they'll say, tell me the interview and what's the question said and, and I'll, I'll tell them, but I haven't made it a practice. So anyway, I love what you're saying about it being insanely fixated on the first question because I debated whether or not to ask the Taylor Swift question first. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you set the right tone with the, the life question. I will uh, say I probably stumbled into this in one of like my first interviews ever was with Nirvana and I was like uh, traveling around with them in Germany and like I, I didn't even have like a master plan because I was like 21 years old and I asked Kurt Cobain you know just sort of like while we're walking like from the club to someplace else if the song Sliver which is like a B-side that it had on like this sub pop single. And the chorus is grandma, take me home, grandma, take me home. It's about like a kid going to his grandparents' house and being unhappy and just wanting to go home. And I said, was that a true story? And I said, oh no, it really kind of happened to my sister, but it didn't happen the same way to me. And it wasn't anything that made it into the article, but like, and I hadn't done this to show off like, oh, well, I know your stuff beyond Smells Like Teen Spirit. I've like, I've done more work. But I realized later, watching other people interview him, how many people came at him with the same question and the same like sort of. Th and I said, "Oh, things went better for me. Why was that?" 
I realized that was part of the reason. Yeah, I, I do think there's a sense too where, you know, some guests have asked me, well, how much of my stuff have you read or whatever, you know? And and I hope that it's evident that I actually have read, <laughs> you know, the books <laughs> and done other research. But I, 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 it's my experience that really that rapport that can come from having done that matters. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of my favorite moments when I'm interviewing authors and if we get sort of like halfway through the interview where all of a sudden they say, wait, how much have you read? Like in that sort of appreciative sense that like you're referring to like an introduction I did for a book 14 years ago. Like, I can't believe you like you dug that up. It's a nice thing that, you know, they feel like somebody's actually paying attention. I mean, as an author, you're always happy when people have read anything beyond just sort of like the flat copy. And if anyone's gone like deeper and like, that's just a gift. Yeah, that's fun. Well, thank you for that. Okay. So that was relationship advice. And <laughs> before we close that out, I just want to share too, that I appreciate a quotation you included from Fred in this book, Kindness and Wonder about, you know, where he said, we speak with more than our mouths. We listen with more than our ears. thought that was really, really beautiful and in line with what you're saying now. Okay, so we've talked about just about all the big things. We talked about death. We've talked about kisses and love. <laughs> we've talked about <laughs> aging. So really, maybe the only major life topic left maybe is money, which is this question. Aside from compound interest, what is the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about money or what's something you're always sure to do with it or never to do with it? Ah, I think the most important thing I've learned about money is just to not use it as like a yardstick of personal worth that, you know, like I like to think I've been sort of reasonably smart in like banal ways about, you know, putting it away, cutting compound interest as your friend. And as you say, but, you know, I've had the, uh, you know, sort of as a writer, it's not always, you know, sort of like the steadiest year after your profession. I've had like really good years and I've had really bad years and like there's spikes and people respond to that. And to, it is very easy to say like, Oh, you know, sort of like, I got paid really well for this project and, you know, like I'm having a great year and I'm a good person this year, or you can be putting as much of yourself into, you know, sort of like a project in the world the following year, and maybe it doesn't happen in the same way. I think not to get too knocked about by like the vicissitudes of money and like, uh, remember that, you know, it's important to help uh, maintain your world, but it's, it doesn't, it's not the measure of who you are. That's, that's great. My dad would have liked that response. Your dad sounds like a cool guy. Mm. Yeah, he, I think he was. He he. One of the things he said to me was, "Money is nothing but numbers on paper and a tool for doing good." Yeah, I was like, I, "That's a good way of thinking of it." Yeah, yeah like, I think he really lived that way. Okay, speaking of money, one of the things I have done to show gratitude, or to, hopefully, <laughs> to show gratitude to you for making the time to share your experience and, and wisdom with me and everyone listening is, I've gone on Kiva.org and made a micro loan of a hundred dollars to an entrepreneur in Nicaragua named Marlene, uh -huh. who will use this money to buy fertilizer and other tools to grow coffee and hopefully okay. improve the quality of life for herself, her family, and her community. Thank you. Thank you. That's a really thoughtful thing to do. I have not been to Nicaragua, but my uh, brother was next door in Honduras for a couple of years when he was in the Peace Corps. And so like, uh, I had uh, I have very positive memories of sort of like visiting that part of the world. So Very cool. Well, I do have just a few more questions, if if you're up for it, uh, related to writing and creativity. Okay. Um, before we go there, so I'm not squeezing it in or forgetting it, if people want to learn more from you or they want to connect with you, what would you have them do? The two easiest, well, aside from the best versions of my writing are the versions in the books. So if they're interested in anything like, oh, Bill Murray sounds great. And they should check out the Bill Murray book. But in a more real-time fashion, I have a website, which is rule42.com, R-U-L-E-F-O-R-T-Y-T-W-O.com. And that's where I blog at just about sort of random things. And I also have a Twitter feed under Mr. Gavin Edwards. Right on. Okay. Thank you. All right. So the final, the final portion here of, of the interview, just with the last, the last few minutes we have, again, is about writing and creativity. Maybe I'll ask you a question or two about what you've learned about successfully promoting a book, getting it out into the world. There's so much we could talk about, but maybe we start with this. What have you, le <laughs> what have you learned about writing that has served you well? Ah, uh, all right, hang on. <laughs> Five second break. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we could go anywhere. We could say who's influenced you as a writer and what have you learned? We could talk about your process of getting a book done. 
We could talk about the qualities of a great sentence and how do we write more of them. We could talk about anything. I'll try to keep my answer short so you can ask as many of them as you want. I think the thing I've learned about writing a book is that, I mean, I think this is true of everything. Like, you know, and this is going to sound maybe obvious, but it's really foundational. You know, sort of paragraphs are made of sentences. And so if you can like write a good sentence and you're thoughtful, you can string them together in paragraphs. And if you can do that, then you can put the paragraphs together in chapters. And if you can do that, then you can put the chapters together in books. So a lot of it is just having the patience to stick with the project that you're writing at the scope where it is. And I like writing longer things actually in longhand. And it's partially because I like the flow that I get into and the ability to sort of mark up and draw arrows and say, and cross things out and I'm doing this. And I also do it because at the end, when I type it up, it makes me really carefully consider every single word so that your eyes don't just sort of like glide over and say, oh, that looks pretty good. But it is also just like this great physical reminder you've been doing that. That like if I've been writing a book for four months, like I have a stack of pages that I didn't have before. And there's something hugely physically satisfying about that that it can motivate you to keep going like, okay, I'm going to add to the stack. And eventually that's going to be enough pages that's going to make up a book. Yeah. No, I lo- one of the things I like about that is, again, it takes it out of the realm of just the conceptual and it makes it actionable. Like just like you're saying, if I can put this pen on this page or I can put my fingers to this keyboard and compose sentences, <laughs> those can become like building blocks of a book. Yeah. And I think, you know, the other advice I always give people is have a routine that, you know, sort of a lot of professional writers have some versions of, I wake up in the morning and I write until I get to a thousand words and then I knock off and I'm done for the day. But, you know, sort of like that may not be a practical piece of advice uh, for people listening. I used to occasionally make comics and I'm not a gifted artist. Like a lot of it was sort of like clip art and stick figures and so on, but it was fun. I was engaged in doing it. And this was at a point where I was at an incredibly like busy life in general. I was like an editor at Details Magazine. You know, I had like a more than full work day. I was also going out to like see shows and I had a social life and so on. But I found that I was almost always like home on a Sunday night. And I just started saying, I can work on this for one hour every Sunday night. That, you know, like after dinner, you know, sort of like between like eight and nine o'clock, I will like do like a few panels of this comic. And it's true, you just chip away and eventually, you know, like, okay, it might take me like two months to make a two page comic, but but that's okay. I can do that. Yeah. No, I love that. It is reminiscent for me of Mason Curry's daily rituals, how artists work, where he goes through and shares, you know, a lot of the disciplines and routines of many famous artists and creatives just a little at a time, but it's in their zone of genius and it's for a a large period, decades in many cases. Right. And just figure out what works for you after that. Like, you know, some people say, I'm just going to write until breakfast and, or that, you know, like I'm at my best, like late at night, but just find out what it is and then commit to that as your practice. Yeah. Well, let me ask you about storytelling. What have you found works well or what's your approach when it comes to relating a story, you know, in the written word to somebody? And and I realize that's, and I, I know I'm kind of <laughs> mangling this question, but I, maybe specifically what I'm looking for is the kind of stories that highlight a point you're trying to make. Right. Well, part of, if I'm like telling any larger story, uh, I've got two ways of answering this question. One is that I need to know for almost anything, where do I start and where do I end? And if I've got that and I've got the anchors, then you can like tie like a rope uh, between them and it's going to be okay. It's going to be taught. It's going to hold your weight. But if when something where like, okay, how am I choosing the material that goes somewhere? And this, I think of this in like a nonfiction sense, but this could be true for like any writer where you're thinking like, you know, what is going to be like the meat of this like passage or this uh, section. And it's, you know, choosing like basically what jumps out at you, what makes your heart sing, what makes uh, like, you know, this when you uh, see it, like for me, it's, I'm going through an, uh, like a transcript of an interview with somebody and I'll like actually just sort of like be putting like stars in the margin. And I'll say, okay, like these three things were the things that obviously like, you know, sang to me and I want to include them. Now, how do I do that in a way it's almost like a logic puzzle? What is the through line? Why did I pick those, you know, sort of, and then you figure out, oh, these are all on the theme of, you know, sort of like the, the, their childhood. Like, well, okay, 
make sure that, you know, like, then that's what we're talking about here. I just haven't like randomly strung them together, but then, you know, sort of like you figure out what sometimes what the point is that you're trying to make by realizing what it was that you were trying to put in there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And and as I, you know, hear what you're sharing and I'm thinking about my own attempts to, to use, you know, stories to make, make points, make it more enjoyable or memorable or whatever. One of the things that, that I'm thinking about right now is how I'm, I'm thinking of two things. One about how stories, I I'm kind of critical of anecdotes because I know you can use an anecdote to prove just about anything. And, and I know readers can be critical, especially skeptical, and that's totally fine. And then I go, well, maybe I should find research to balance this out and blah, blah, blah. But that's all inside my head. I should probably be asking you these questions, but I don't know if you if you have an experience like that. Anecdotes are really powerful. I mean, that, that's why people do them. I mean, you know, Jesus used them and he called them parables. <laughs> so it's... Yeah. That's a good point. You know, like people, uh, like anecdotes are just stories in miniature. So... You know, if it's a persuasive essay, then and you've got like other facts to back it up, that's great. But what people remember is the anecdote. Yeah, for sure. Well, the other the other thing, and I and I realize here this conversation is very specific to you know nonfiction and also this kind of writing, making you know a story to make a, a piece more memorable, more relatable, more enjoyable, whatever, more effective. One of the things that I sometimes feel like I struggle with is giving like taking that story from something that's pretty two dimensional in in other words telling the story to showing the story where i wasn't there i'm not going back to ask him hey paint me the bring me there what were the smells what were the sights what were the sounds like how do you how do you think about taking something from black and white so to speak to making it color without you know embellishing unduly right so I, yeah, I think about this a lot. And uh, part of it is that like, you know, you don't want to be dishonest. You want it to be vivid and you also want it to be honest. That, And sometimes and this is where it just sort of gets into, you use whatever you've got. And so, you know, as an interviewer, I've learned to like get as much information like about this uh, stuff as I go along that, you know, don't rely on people to give you those vivid details. Like if I'm interviewing somebody, like I absolutely ask them. One of my favorite things ever like that was talking with Bobby Bird, who was in uh, James Brown's band. And we were talking about the famous, like, sort of, like, Live at the Apollo album. And I asked him, where did you guys go for your dinner break? And it was just sort of like, and the other, there was like a fried fish place, like, right next to the Apollo. And, like, and that was great. You know, like, it's not like that is the foundation of rock history, but it was just sort of like, okay, like, now I can, like, one little thing like that can be enough to, like, hang your hat on. Sometimes... You do need to just like keep on going and you know sort of talk with somebody else or find a different angle or find a way to make it happen. But when you don't, there's other things you can do. You can you know sort of you can inject yourself, which is something I always am very uh, sort of like cautious about because you don't want everything to turn into a personal essay. But like where necessary, you can bring in more of your own presence and more of your own personality. You can do writerly tricks by which i mean like sort of start playing with rhythm and you know, like you make something more staccato or you make it the, you know you start playing with form in a way that you know sort of like gooses the energy of what you're doing and maybe gets you past the fact that you don't have as much uh, to play with uh, there as you like so but there's no one answer to this i mean like the fundamental answer is have the details in the first place and then it's how uh, like when you don't what else can you do yeah no, that, that makes sense. And and that whole thing too about voice and injecting yourself and things like that. I'm curious how much you think about that before you start writing, because I'm thinking now about the kind of writing I've read in Rolling Stone that I actually quite like when the when the author is saying, you know, it's it's four PM and Lil Wayne hasn't shown up for forty five minutes, you know. And I'm like getting a sense of you know, talking to a friend or something, you know. So I, how do you approach that kind of voice and telling from the outset or do you let it evolve or what do you do? I, I mean, it emerges, I find it's really great when it works out and when it doesn't, it's just like the most self-indulgent thing in the world. Like, <laughs> uh, and it, like sort of, so I, I never go in planning to do that. There are times where you realize that you are contorting yourself, trying to tell the story and pretending that you were not a part of it that you know sort of like if somebody like starts asking you about something like really personal the only real way to sort of like you know get across what this conversation was like this was to say this is what it was like to be there at that moment and this is like the conversation that we had great you know like then there's a reason for you to be there but if it's for me i just love the sense of like 
you know, you're in the room with this person, but it's not so much about like sort of my presence. It's much more about like their presence. No, there's, there's definitely an art and I think a science to that to some degree. Yeah, no, it's a craft. I mean, there's definitely things I learned just, you know, sort of like, you know, you write your first like 10 or 12, you know, sort of like personality profiles and they're just like, oh, this is like, it's, it's a medium like any other, or it's a format like any other. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe the final question here then is just what kind of advice or encouragement? So it's really, if, if time allows these two, two questions, one is about the advice and encouragement you would leave anyone listening who is currently involved in their own creative endeavor. Like, what do you say to help them get it over the finish line and out into the world? And then, and if there's a question behind that is just broadly, what are the final words you leave our listeners with? All right. I mean, I think these are one and the same and it's, you can do it. <laughs> You really can't. That I don't know what the it is, but if you started it, you had a plan, you have an idea, and the world is going to be a better place for you finishing it. Uh, you know, like, and I don't know if that means that you know, sort of, dozens of people are going to be experience this, or you know, sort of, or hundreds or thousands, but making art and making uh, things with like craftsmanship is like a value unto itself. So whether that's, you know, you like uh, built a table or whether it's you wrote a poem or whether it's you finished a painting, like any of these things are worthwhile on their own and hardly anything is going to get better by you chewing on it forever and ever. That, you know, sort of almost everything, finish it up, you know, sort of like it won't be perfect, but it'll be better that you did it. And then you like take what you learned and you go on to the next thing. And I think that's true in many aspects of life. You know, it's, some things never end. It's not like, oh, I'm done being like a father to this kid. I'm going to move on to the next kid. <laughs> but you do finish the day. When you get to the end of the day, say like, I did what I could with this day. You know, sort of like I achieved everything I could, like in sort of my family, my life. And, you know, some days are going to be better than others, but they're almost always, they're all going to be done. And then, you know, sort of you take what you got from them and like you apply that lesson to the next day. Beautiful. Awesome. Well, thank you, Gavin. This has truly been a pleasure reading your book. Kindness and Wonder has been a pleasure. I'm not sure when our paths will cross again, but I know they will. I hope they do, though, Brian. I've really, really enjoyed this. Yeah, me, me too. Brian, please take care of yourself. You too. Despite living in an age where we have more comforts and conveniences than ever before, life isn't working for many people. Whether it's in the developed world, where we're dealing with depression, anxiety, addiction, divorce, jobs we hate, relationships that don't work, or people in the developing world who don't have access to clean water or sanitation or healthcare or education, or who live in conflict zones, there's a lot of people on the planet that life isn't working very well for. If you're one of those people, I invite you to connect with me at goodliving.com. I've created Life's Best Practices Breakthrough Coaching to help you navigate the transitions that we all go through. Whether you've just graduated school, you're going through a divorce, you just got married, you're headed into retirement, you're starting a business, you just lost your job, whatever it is you're facing, I've developed a 36-week course that you go through with me and a community of achievers and seekers who are committed to improving their own lives and the lives of others. So through this online program, you will have the opportunity to go deep into every area of your life, explore life's big questions, create answers for yourself in community get clarity and accountability. If that's something you're interested to learn about, I invite you to contact me directly at brian at brianmiller.com or by visiting goodliving.com.